Good morning. On behalf of the Schiller Institute, I would like to welcome everyone to today's conference, actually the second day of a two-day conference entitled Mankind's Existence Now Depends on the Establishment of a New Paradigm. Yesterday morning's panel was called The Urgent Need to Replace Geopolitics with a New Paradigm in International Relations. The afternoon panel uh, was called uh, For a Better Understanding of How Our Universe Functions. This morning's panel, Creativity as the Distinctive Characteristic of Human Culture, the Need for a Classical Renaissance, celebrates the idea that creativity is intelligible. Because it is intelligible, creativity can be wielded as a weapon against any problem faced, either by the human race or by life or non-life, with which the human race has contact. Rather than the now popular idea that human beings are a bane on the planet, or the solar system, or the galaxy, consider the opposite view. What if the purpose of the invention of the human race in this universe of well over two trillion galaxies were to free nature through the practice of what we will call self-consciousness from the limitations of an evolutionary pro process otherwise depending merely upon physiology or a mutation? What if the idea of musical harmony, as the scientist and theologian Johannes Kepler conceived, as in his Harmony of the Worlds, were the natural principle of evolution in the universe, rather than the Darwin's survival of the fittest? Does the principle of world harmony hold not only in astrophysics, but also in biophysics and perhaps microphysics? It may well be that replacing our outmoded ideas of evolution in favor of viewing human creativity as an essential and unique invention by the universe of a more perfect mode of evolution than Darwinian species selection may force us to give up old, wrong, false axioms and embrace the ideas in which our very survival as a species may depend. Ludwig van Beethoven, whose 250th birthday we celebrate this year, believed that we must seek our destiny in and over the canopy of the stars. He used Friedrich Schiller's poem, The Ode to Joy, in his Ninth Symphony, which at one point exclaims, suffer on courageous millions, suffer for a better world, or the tent of stars unfurled, God rewards you from the heavens. It is in the potential for the immortality of the human species that the purpose for our individual existence may be discovered. The development, the actualization of that potential is not only called science, but also music. It is that which Beethoven and Schiller celebrated in their Ninth Symphony. We begin today's proceedings with a performance of the Beethoven song cycle, Andi Ferne Gelita, Opus 98, performed by tenor John Segerson and pianist Margaret Greenspan. Will ich Lieder 
Herz an dir um Wang und Brust in den seidenen Locken wühlen. Teilt euch mit euch diese Lust. Hey, zu dir von jeder Lüge rämt sich dieses Bäcklein als wird ihr Bild sich in die Spiegel. Fließ zurück, dann unverweilt, fließ zurück, dann unverweilt, ja unverweilt.
Thank you, John and Margaret. In 1994, at an extraordinary conference on music at Howard University's Rankin Hall, featuring the artists George Shirley, Robert McFerrin, William Warfield, Sylvia Olden Lee, the Reverend James Coakley, Elvira Green, and others, Lyndon LaRouche offered these observations in his conclusion. The thing that has put me into conflict with many professional musical groups and others, those who teach so-called aesthetics, is that I insist, for reasons which I've indicated, that the creative powers which are associated with great classical art, whether the work of a da Vinci or Raphael in painting, also in music, by the way, with Da Vinci, in great music, in great architecture, and these one great drama, great tragedy, all these things which, exe which exemplify the creative principle and express it, which ennoble the minds of the audiences as well as the participants, the lack of that kind of environment, that kind of education, deprive society of the ability to do science, as they might say. That the principles of scientific discovery and the principles of artistic creativity are identical. They are also complementary. I know of very few creative scientists, generally, who are not involved, in, usually in classical music in some way or other or in some form of art. It's the most natural thing in the world. Not to have music and with, with science is like having only one half of yourself. It completes you, just as it nourished me. And I've insisted 
that music is intelligible. It's hard work, but it's intelligible. I've insisted that it's communicable, that if we start with children and teach them to sing and teach them instruments on the basis of understanding simply singing beautifully, that if we do that, we can make it comprehensible to them in the same way we make science comprehensible. Yes, we don't know all the principles, but if we work at it, we keep uncovering new principles just the way some associates of mine and I are having a great time with what has been a 50-year, 55-year dedication of my life to, to, to understand what the last quartets of Beethoven are and why they're so great. And today I'm beginning to understand that. For me, that illustrates the fact that all art is intrinsically intelligible. There is no intuitive, magical thing about it. It's hard work but hard work evoking those creative powers of the mind which teach us that we are each in the image of God and that we require a form of society, a form of relationship among human beings which recognizes that we are all brothers and sisters as children in the image of God. Thank you. The man standing and applauding Mr. LaRouche is William Warfield, the great bass baritone. Mr. Warfield was a member of the board of the Schiller Institute and would have celebrated his 100th birthday <clears throat> this year in January. We dedicate this panel to his memory and his art, as well as to the memory and art of Lyndon LaRouche. There's a collection of LaRouche's writings on music called Think Like Beethoven, which is just published this year. And it contains an essay, The Floristan Principle in Art. Floristan is a key figure in Beethoven's opera Fidelio, who spoke the truth and chains were his reward. Our keynote speaker for this morning has lived that Beethoven drama, which is not a tragedy. Fidelio created something new in music and drama as we must create something new now, today, to save the world from the darkness that threatens to engulf it. To discuss why to think like Beethoven is the standard for durable survival for civilization worldwide. It is my honor, as always, to introduce to you Helga Sepp LaRouche, founder and chairman of the Schiller Institute. Hello. I greet you uh, all over the world uh, listening to this conference. Now, since this is an international conference, let me say a few words of why the Schiller Institute is named according to the great German poet of freedom. The main reason is that the, <clears throat> his magnificent image of man which is linked to the idea that each and every person can be in principle to develop to be a beautiful soul. And that is what you just got a glimpse of with the beautiful performance by John Sigerson of An die Ferne Geliebte. And Beethoven and Schiller in that sense are very similar uh, as uh, towering giants of the German classical period. For Schiller, a beautiful soul means a person for whom freedom and necessity, duty and passion are one. A state of mind which, according to Schiller, only applies for a genius. The Schiller Institute also agrees fully with Schiller that the way to reach this goal lies in the aesthetic education, which is successful in the moment it's pursued as a purpose. I'm really very thankful to my German teachers for awakening enthusiasm for Schiller's concept of the beautiful soul when I was a pupil. His concept of the sublime and his lofty ideal of art with that sorts that have always provided me personally with a key to inner strength and independent thinking. I consider it a fortunate coincidence that I first got to know through my own education 
the ideal of a beautiful humanity through the works of Schiller, and only then, armed with this vision of what man can be, I did look into the history of the 20th century. My late husband, Lyndon LaRouche, and I shared the belief that mankind's moral fitness to survive depends on, <clears throat> uh, depends on the ability to develop one's thinking to the level that corresponds to this great classical art. I have often expressed this conviction in many lectures and speeches, and I often had the impression that most people considered this to be a more or less curious point of view on my part. In the past weeks, however, during the coronavirus pandemic, this view has been confirmed from a very practical perspective. A lot of people reacted to the lockdown and the contact ban, which was ordered by many governments uh, to the <clears throat> uh, coronavirus pandemic by acting out even more freely their hedonistic impulses, such as, quote, escaping to the mountains or to the beaches, with young people celebrating so-called coronavirus parties and longing for the reopening of the clubs and the tattoo parlors, uh, completely indifferent to the effects that such a behavior can have on the overall course of the pandemic and the lives of so many other people. Friedrich Schiller, like many contemporaries of his time, had followed the initial phase of the French Revolution with the hope that it would bring the spirit of the American Revolution to Europe. In, 19, in 1792, he was granted even the honorary citizenship of France by the National Assembly. But once the Jacobin terror took over, he turned away in horror. In the aesthetical letters, which he wrote as an answer to the French Revolution, he developed the concept of aesthetic education and asked the question, how is it that we are still barbarians? And in the fifth letter, he describes the state of his contemporaries, which he would find as being surpassed in the reflection of the present today. Man, he says, paints himself in his actions. And what is the form depicted in the drama of the present time? On the one hand, barbarization, on the other, a state of lethargy. The two extremes of one human degeneracy and both together in one and the same period. In the lower, larger masses, coarse, lawless impulses come to view, breaking loose when the bonds of civil order are burst asunder and hastening with unbridled fury to satisfy their savage instinct. Society set free, instead of hastening upward into organic life, collapses into its elements. On the other hand, the civilized classes give us still more repulsive sides of lethargy and of a depravity of character, which is the more revolting because its roots are in culture. I forgot who of the old or newer philosophers remarked that the nobler, is more revolting in its destruction. Schiller responds to this dilemma with the thesis that any improvement in the political realm can only come through aesthetic education, the ennoblement of the character of the individual. In the ninth letter, he defines the fine arts as the, dom as the domain that can lead people into new area areas of thinking and feeling that raise them above barbarism and lethargy. Like Confucius, Schiller was of the opinion that one needs to take people during their leisure, when they are free from the everyday burdens, and lift them up playfully to a higher level of fine arts, that from the moment they become involved in the creativity of the composer, the painter, the po poet, and leave the domain of their ordinary desires, they, at least in that moment of immersion in a work of art, 
take part in something larger than, that goes beyond the level of sensuality. That is why Schiller insisted that art only deserves the name if it is beautiful, because only beauty as a concept that corresponds to reason and appeals to sensuality can reconcile the mind with the emotions. That is, it can develop the emotions up to the level of reason. Schiller expressed this notion already in one of his very early works, The Theosophy of Julius, where he says, all spirits are attracted by perfection. There are many deviations, but there is no exception to this for all strive after the condition of the highest free exercise of their powers. All possess the common drive to extend their sphere of action, to draw themselves, to gather in themselves, to appropriate everything that they recognize as good, as excellent, as delightful, to contemplate the beautiful, the true, and the excellent means to immediately take possession of such properties. Whichever condition we perceive, we enter into. At the moment we think of them, we become a possessor of a virtue, author of an action, discoverer of a truth, possess possessor of a happiness. We ourselves become the object perceived. We ourselves become the object perceived. This is also the insight behind Plato's warning that children should not, under no circumstances, look at the tragedies of the great tragedians for the issues raised there, such as nemesis, revenge, and doom. Schiller even insisted that the artist had to ennoble himself to the highest ideal of humanity before he dared to move his audience. And that, that because he was so acutely aware of the profound effect of art for good or for bad. After Schiller's death, Wilhelm von Humboldt wrote in his essay, Schiller and the Cause of His Spiritual Development. Concerning the concept of beauty, concerning the aesthetic in creation and action, and thus the foundation of art, as well as art itself. These works contain everything essential in a manner which can never be excelled. Never before were these questions discussed in such a pure, complete and illuminating way as by Schiller. Infinitely much was thus gained, not merely for the positive analysis of concepts, but also for aesthetic and moral education. Art and poetry were directly joined to that which is most noble in humanity, were presented as that by which humanity first awakens to the consciousness of the intrinsic nature which strives to transcend the finite. Have we today lost all receptivity to this dimension of human identity, the instance in which the individual's life is linked to the higher goals of humanity? Is it the case that the complex transcendent creations of classical art that accomplish just that belong to the past never never land and that the present belongs to spectator sports and beauty saloons? But perhaps there is a more hopeful prospect. During the corona confinement, there were spontaneous manifestations of a deeper need for classical art, uh, which emerged in many places around the world. People in Italy, France, and Germany, and other countries spontaneously started singing Verdi and Beethoven from their balconies or playing on their instruments. And perhaps the realization is gaining ground that after this pandemic, which will be no doubt with us for a while, nothing will be the same as before. In any case, it demands us uh, that a spirit that can be found most, it demands of us a spirit that most clearly can be found in Schiller's concept of the sublime, which Schiller says not, does not protect our weak physical existence, but it can make us morally secure. Therefore, let us use this time of unprecedented challenges 
to delve deeper than ever into the works of the best classical art and through dialogue among the greatest compositions of all cultures of this world to create the basis for a new renaissance of the classics, which is the essence of what the new paradigm must follow after this crisis. Because what Schiller says in the introduction to the bride, to his play, The Bride of Medina, uh, Messina, is absolutely true. Genuine art, however, does not have as its object a mere transitionary game. Its serious purpose is not merely to translate the human being into a momentarily dream of freedom, but to actually make him free. It accomplishes this by awakening a power within him, by using and developing this power to remove to a distance of objectivity the sensory world, which otherwise only weighs us down as raw material and oppresses us as a blind force, to transform the sensory world into a free creation of our spirit and to control the material world through ideas. So we need a classical renaissance of classical thinking. And the best you can do is become an active part of that. Thank you, Helga. We made a slight change in our program this morning in its order. And we're going to turn to Eugene Simpson, Professor Emeritus of Voice and Choral Literature, Rowan University of New Jersey, the founding curator of the Hall Johnson Collection, and we will, he will be speaking on the topic of Hall Johnson and the Dvorak Dream from Spiritual to Art Song. But we thought it would be appropriate to introduce that presentation with recitations by William Warfield of two poems by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. These were done for the Schiller Institute back in 1995. They are both in English, but one is in a dialect form. They are both about music, poets, singers, and their differing capacities. Following these recitations, we will go directly to Professor Simpson's presentation. Prometheus stole from heaven the sacred fire and swept to earth with it o'er land and sea. He lit the vestal flames of poesy, content for this to brave celestial ire. Wroth were the gods with eternal hate pursued the fearless one who ravished heaven that earth might hold and feed the perfect heaven to lift men's souls above their low estate. But judge you now when poets wield their pen. Think not well the wrong has been repaired. T'was all in vain that ill Prometheus fared. The fire has been returned to heaven again. We have no singers like the ones whose note gave challenge to the noblest warbler's song. We have no voice so mellow, sweet, and strong as that which broke from Shelley's golden throat. The measure of our songs is our desires. We tinkle where old poets used to storm. We lack their substance, though we keep their form. We strum our banjo strings and call them liars. I might say as a personal thing, this, this particular one is one that I remember from a young boy hearing uh, every Sunday that we had a musical, we always had somebody who was considered one of the ladies of the church who was really into elocution. <laughs> and uh, this one I remember hearing along with Lies Lies, you remember that one? Some of you know that one. Along when I was no more than about 12 years old. Go away and quit that noise, Miss Lucy. Put that music book away. What's the use to keep on trying if you practice till you gray? You can't start no notes of flying like the ones that rants and rings from the kitchen to the big wood when Melinda sings. 
You ain't got the natural organs for to make the sound come right. You ain't got the turns and twists for to make it sweet and light. Tell you one thing now, Miss Lucy, and I'm telling you for true. When it comes to rare rock singing, it ain't no easy thing to do. Easy enough for folks to holler looking at the lines and dots when there ain't no one can sense it and the tune comes in and spots. But for real melodious music that just strikes your heart and cleans, just you stand and listen with me when Melindy sings. Ain't you never heard Melindy bless your soul, take up the cross? Look at honey, you ain't you joking, honey? Well, you don't know what you lost. You ought to hear that gal a wobbling, robins, locks, and all them things. Hesh they mouths and hide their faces when Melinda sings. <laughs> Fiddling man just stops his fiddle, lays his fiddle on the shelf. Mockingbird quit trying to whistle because he just so shame himself. <laughs> Folks are playing on the banjo, draps their fingers on the string. Bless your soul, forgets to move them when Melinda sings. She just spreads her mouth and hollers, Come to Jesus. Till you hear sinners trembling, steps and voices timid like a drawing near. Then she turns to rock of ages, clear for me. Simply to the cross she clings. And you find your tears are dragging when Melinda sings. Who that says that humble praises with the master never count? Hesh your mouth, I hear that music as it rises up in mounts, floating on the hills and valley, way above this burying sod, as it makes its way to glory to the very gates of God. Oh, it's sweeter than the music of an educated band and it's dearer than the battle songs of triumph in the land. And it seems holier than evening when the solemn church bells rings as I sit and calmly listen while Melinda sings. Towser, stop that barking. Hear me? Man, they make that child keep still. Don't you hear the echoes calling from the valley to the hill? Let me listen. I can hear it. Through the brush of angels' wings, soft and sweet, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home, as Melindy sings. The arrival in America of the renowned conductor and composer Antonin Dvorak marked the second stage in the evolution of the spiritual. It was the fabled Fisk Jubilee Singers, founded in 1871, who first introduced the genre to the country and to the world in 1873 as a choral form with their European tour and their appearance before Queen Victoria of England. Despite the singers of these tours in America and in London, some white audiences, critics, and performers ridiculed the spirituals, robbing them of their beauty and sacred nature. While black-faced minstrels substituted profane and comedic texts in a manner that made some African Americans ashamed to sing them. White and black writers and singers abruptly and erroneously labeled them slave songs, sorrow songs, and plantation songs, all inaccurate titles of derogation. Dr. Robert R. Moton, an alumnus of Hampton Institute, who succeeded Booker T. Washington as principal of Tuskegee Institute, speaks of the effect white minstrelry had on him and his valuation of the spirituals while a young man. I felt 
that the white men were making fun not only of our color and our songs, but of our religion. It took three years training at Hampton Institute to bring me to the point of being willing to sing Negro songs uh, in the presence of white people. White minstrels with black faces have done more than any other single agency to lower the tone of Negro music and cause the Negro to despise his own songs. The timely but relatively brief stay of Antonin Dvorak as director of the National Conservatory of Music allowed him to develop a relationship with Harry Burley, a student at the conservatory, and to be introduced to the spiritual which Harry sang. During his three-year period, Dvorak wrote his symphony from the New World that incorporated thematic material from the spiritual Wing Low Sweet Chariot and utilized the pentatonic scale in the slow movement, going home. Uh, more importantly, Georgia proclaimed, in the Negro's Mer Melodies of America, I discover all that is needed for a great and noble school of music. The utilization of the material in his symphony of the New World effectively proved this, elevated the material, and freed American composers to use it, as did George Gershwin, Morton Gould, Louis Grunberg, William Tippett, William Dawson, and others. compositions of 
Johnson. This stadium, the art song for Schubert, Brahm, and Strauss represented the merging of great poetry and great music. In this respect, Johnson was greatly advantaged, for in addition to being a fine arranger and composer, he demonstrated unusual literary gifts honed by a fine education at Allen University, where his father was president, University of Pennsylvania, Juilliard, and the University of Southern California. Upon graduation from the University of Pennsylvania in 1910, he won the Simon Hester Award for the Best Composition for Choir and Orchestra. A gifted violist, Johnson studied violin with Frederick Hahn, a former player with the Boston Symphony. In New York, Johnson made a living playing with the stage bands on Broadway and on tour. He was awarded an honorary doctorate by the Philadelphia Musical Academy of 1934. In addition to a book of poetry, much of which is included in my biography of Hall Johnson, Johnson also wrote the book and script for his Broadway musical, Run Little Chillin', which opened in 1933 and ran for four months at the height of the Depression. After the Green Pastures, which opened on Broadway in 1930 with a Hall Johnson Choir, won the Pulitzer Prize and became a motion picture which sold 6,000 tickets an hour when it opened at Radio City Music Hall. Black and white concert singers demanded arrangements of spirituals by Johnson. Singers like the great Marian Anderson, Carol Bryce, Inez Matthews, Lawrence Winters, Robert McFerrin, William Warfield, and Shirley Barrett found in many of the Hall Johnson concert arrangements the same elements they found in the art songs they programmed. To make the traditional spiritual a more classical and substantial form, Johnson adopted the compositional techniques of the great classical songwriters. He expanded the form of the spiritual. Beyond strophic, modified strophic, and through composed, using forms from simple stanza, A-A-A, uh, an example of which is his setting of crucifixion, uh, to A-B stanza, uh, A, B stanza, the typical uh, verse and refrain, as typified by City Called Heaven, uh, to an elaborate structure in his original spiritual Ain't Got Time to Die, which is form A1, B1, C1, A2, B2, C2, A3, B3, C3, and Coda. From the classic art song, Johnson used a variety of techniques to make his arrangement interesting and effective. A partial list that would include introduction and coda, prelude and postlude, or descriptive accompanimental forms or figures, polymeters, imitation, use of thematic material in the accompaniment, exchanging thematic fragments between the voice and piano, substituting the hum or a neutral syllable for the text. One of Johnson's most popular arrangements, right on King Jesus, combines very effectively a half dozen compositional techniques in the manner of the most skilled composers. The introduction is but a single 
measure of ascending octaves in four four times, beginning on the dominant and leading uh, to the maestro entry of the voice on the tonic. At the end of the first period, there is an abrupt change of mood, dynamic, and meter to 2-4, where the piece will remain to the end. For he is king of kings, he is lord of lords. Johnson fashions a new thematic motive from the ascending scale in the introduction. Starting this time on tonic, with the text, King Jesus rides in the middle of the air and creates a response with a descending figure. No man works like him. From dominant back to tonic. Johnson works in two verses between a triumphant restatement of the quarter note maestro sosi from a dramatic decrescendo. At the end of the section comes a fugato led by the solo piano. Johnson marks this piano takes over. This leads the long crescendo to the phrase Jesus Christ, the first in love. No man works like him. As the section ends on the word him, the coda begins with the melody in the bass chords for four measures, followed by the frenetic triplet at the end. He is a king. He is a and ask, who is the greatest arranger, Paul Johnson or William Dawson? I answer the question with another. Who is the greatest classical songwriter, Schubert, Rob, or Strauss? I must say, however, that Johnson touches me with an inward and external joy that Dawson does not. Perhaps these two works that represent the epitome of internal joy as expressed by Johnson, Old Glory and City Called Heaven, are ideal. Both are so simple, yet so touching. The prelude and postlude of Old Glory recalls Schubert's setting of Heine's Amer. The mood of the piece is captured perfectly with only two chords repeated. After the drama of the clouds and the tears, the same mood is recaptured by the use of the same chord.
Uh, the performance you will hear is from a live recital by Eugene Damon Simpson at Rowan University. The accompanist is Lawrence Wick.
aspect of Dvorak's dream was to see the thematic material of the spiritual used as source material for classical instrumental music. This was realized in the Negro Folk Symphony of William Dawson, which was premiered by Leopold Stokowski in 1933. Frederick Delius, Florida Suite No. 3, Around the Plantation. Morton Gould, Spirituals for Orchestra. Philip Smith, Rhapsody on Negro Spirituals. Michael Tippett, A Child of Our Time. Louis Grunberg, Emperor Jones, George Gershwin, Porgy and Beth, and Hall Johnson's extended works, Fire, The Green Pastor, Run Little Chillin', Spiritual Moods 1 and 2, and Son of Man. Save for Fire, all of these works were performed to great success. The Green Pastors, originally on Broadway, had a run of over 1,200 performances. Run Little Children ran on Broadway for four months. Spiritual Moods for Bell Quartet and Orchestra was a hit throughout Europe and South America. And Son of Man was performed at New York City Opera with 300 singers and at Carnegie Hall with 500 singers. In 2019, Dr. Roland Carter revived Son of Man in a performance by the Houston Negro Opera Chorus, which he magnanimously dedicated to me. Of all the works included in the cantata, by far the most popular remains Hall Johnson's original spiritual, Ain't Got Time to Die. Thanks to the cooperation of Hal Leonard, I was able to get this work and nine others republished digitally two years ago. The solo version demonstrates amazing and distinctive features that become typical and characteristic of all Johnson. One, the accompaniment requires a professional pianist because of its difficulty. Two, the accompaniment begins sparsely and simply and increases in complexity to the end. Three, Johnson elaborates on the form of the typical spiritual going beyond the typical A-B, repeat, to 1-A-B, 1-B, 1-C, 2-A, 2-B, 2-C, 3-A, 3-B, 3-C, and coda. He uses fragmented phrasing, and five, he uses the hook, which is typical and requires advanced breathing. A word about the hook. The hook is the fact that there's always an upbeat, which does not allow any time for you to breathe at the end of a section. Uh, you will find, and then ain't got time to die. Half the time, he doesn't finish the phrase in the voice. He finishes the phrase uh, with a note in the keyboard. That gives the vocalist a mo- an instant to get a breath. Six. He uses an extended introduction and a coda with terminal development. Lord, keep so busy praising my Jesus. Keep so busy praising my Jesus. Keep so busy praising my Jesus. Ain't got time to die for. If one listens carefully, one B which follows, is an improvisation on the melody of 1A, done in what is almost a jazz style without any loss of the sacred nature of the work. Note that it is fragmentary and that the melodic interruption is characteristic of Johnson's style. 
This adds to the effectiveness of Johnson's work, as it is the syncopation that is at the heart of black music. The first flight of fancy returns to earth in the final phrase. The voice does not complete the final phrase. The piano does. At the end of the second section, when the text changes to keep so busy serving my master, the accompaniment introduces a figure descriptive to illustrate that. Here in section 2B, when I'm feeding the poor, Johnson carefully avoids the tonic and allows the tension to build. The accompaniment that started with a few thin chords is becoming fuller and more sonorous. Section 3 begins softly with the phrase, Lord, I keep so busy serving my master, but opens up in the voice and the piano at 3D when the text becomes, when I'm giving my all. Not only are there full chords in the accompaniment, but Johnson inserts melodic material in the bass. Section 3C concludes on a deceptive cadence and moves into an exciting and well-developed coda, which taxes vocalists and pianists to the maximum. The extreme ranges of the piano are used, much as with Debussy and Ravel, but to a totally different effect. It is likely that a choral performance of this work that I conducted the Virginia State University Concert Choir in on April 12, 1970, was the last performance that Johnson ever heard. Though I had forgotten that he promised to attend my concert at the Church of the Hill, he strode majestically down the nave at age 82 and sat on the front row. The choir sang his choral arrangement of Ain't Got Time to Die as an encore, and he got a standing ovation. Eighteen days later, he was dead of smoke inhalation when he fell asleep while smoking. My sincere thanks to the Schiller Institute New York Community Chorus for this wonderful program. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. And by the way, you can hear the full excerpts at our website uh, after the panel today. Uh, next, we will hear from John Segerson, the music director for the Schiller Institute and the co-author of its Manual on the Rudiments of Tuning and Registration. And he will speak about the physical power of classical poetry and music. John? Good afternoon. As I reflected on this year of Beethoven and on how to seize its opportunity, I recalled a debate of sorts that I had in 1972 or 1973, shortly after I had joined up with Lyndon LaRouche after attending a series of classes devoted to two topics, classical music on the one side and on the other, the only economics that I'd found which addressed my obsession 
at the time with economic progress, especially in Africa. Two subjects with my, which my college teachers had insisted were completely unrelated. So I was talking at the time with a Columbia student of music composition, whom I was attempting to recruit to the idea that the world would be a, be would be a better place if composers would take up the challenge that Beethoven had thrown down in his late works, especially his late string quartets. Can you compose works like Beethoven did? I asked the student. Oh yeah, sure, I could, no problem, he replied with a little bit of a swagger. Well then, I pressed, well, why don't you just do so? Uh, to which he breezily answered, oh, because I don't choose to do so. And he quickly scuttled away. Well, that's still the, still the problem today. This challenge, not only to, to transmit Beethoven's ideas through honest performance, but to reach beyond Beethoven, has haunted human civilization ever since the composer's death in March 1827. A very few, such as Schumann and Brahms, have accepted the full challenge, while so many others, such as Wagner and the Romantics, Stravinsky and the Modernists, not to mention the purveyors of mass popular entertainment, have chosen not to do so. How can we take up this challenge today? Certainly the study, singing, and playing of great classical works is essential for our survival. Yet, we cannot fall into the trap, which so many artists do, of believing that mastering the style of classical music does justice to the composer or to us. Great classical music has never been a matter of style, but rather of an unquenchable yearning to transmit universal platonic ideas, universal principles concerning the true nature of mankind, that which distinguishes him from all other creatures known to us so far, on our journey through universal space-time. Lyndon LaRouche threw us back then a lifeline for grappling with this challenge when he characterized the classical lead, the classical art song, as the Rosetta Stone of music. He said that the singing of poetry is a never-failing source of inspiration to the composing mind. All great classical poetry from the Vedic hymns to, to Homer, to Dante, Shakespeare, Schiller, Shelley, and Poe is sung poetry. And conversely, all great music, whether performed by singers, by instrumentalists, or com combinations of both, must be sung, and sung with beauty and grace, if it is to be intended, if, if it is to have its intended effect to uplift and transform performers and audiences alike. Poetry, like music, is never a matter of style, but a matter of purpose. Particularly in troubled times, composers have taken up the songs and poems of unknown bards of the people, so-called folk songs, as a means of enriching and ennobling popular culture by raising these songs of life and of love to the highest level of moral and artistic perfection. The elevation of the African-American spiritual, as discussed by my colleagues here, is a unique, precious example in American culture. Similarly, during the 19th century, the folk songs of many European cultures were, bought, uh, were brought to a high level of perfection by Beethoven himself, and especially by Johannes Brahms and Antonin Dvorak, as we heard earlier. In China, which has a rich trove of songs of the people, I believe that composers have yet to accomplish this to the same level as, say, Brahms. But I'm confident that if China is not destroyed in a nuclear holocaust so desperately hoped for by the old paradigm dinosaurs, this will not be long in coming. And yet, in our Western culture today, the resonance of these songs of life and love among the broad masses of our population has been fading away 
under the onslaught of the brutal, bestial, rigid, largely sex-driven pop culture. To such an extent that if you ask a young American today if they know a simple song they might have sung from childhood, more likely than not, they'll remain silent and look at you in a very quizzical way. Um, so can true classical composition on the order of a Bach, Beethoven, Brahms be revived in the face of this brutalization of our people's culture, where the resonances of history have been supplanted by the futile quest for the here and for the now? Well, I believe it can, but only if poets and composers agree personally to sub submit themselves to a struggle, not just to create beautiful melodies or clever musical juxtapositions, but to deliberately shape the intended physical effect of their own creations. Now in a second, I'm gonna illustrate what I mean by this with an example of two very fine musicians named Max Planck and Albert Einstein. But first, what do I mean by physical? Well, I mean it in the same way that Lyndon LaRouche discusses physical economy. Anyone familiar with LaRouche's discussions and writings, which I urge you to study, uh, must realize that by physical, LaRouche is not referring to things, whether these be pieces of plant and equipment or human beings, but rather to validated universal physical principles, which man can discover by means of creative acts for the benefit of mankind's future existence and for the increased happiness of the universe itself. The musicians, Planck and Einstein, of course, also happen to be gifted theoretical physicists. As the fruit of their struggle, they discovered the quantized nature of electromagnetic energy a discovery which led directly into our still very partial mastery of nuclear power. And now, please pardon me if I skip over many technical details, crucial though they may be. They may be, they may be. Max Planck grew up in Germany during the latter half of the 19th century. When he announced to his friends that he was going to become a physicist instead of a pianist and composer, some of his associates told him that he was wasting his time because all of the basic laws of discrete matter on the one side and of perfectly continuous electromagnetic magnetic energy on the other had already been discovered. Nevertheless, a problem that continued to confound physicists was the so-called black body problem. And I'm gonna go into this just a little bit. The challenge was to pin down the distribution of power and frequencies of substances, especially metals, which, when they become hotter, emit light at various frequencies, first in the lower red frequencies, as you see when a piece of metal begins to glow red, and then as the temperature increases, going towards white. The so-called black body was a device for testing this with great precision. The practical problem was that no one had been able to work out a formula for the distribution of the frequencies. This had become a matter of some urgency for industrial production, since the fabrication of reliable light bulbs required such a calculation. And indeed, the electric firm Siemens funded an entire institution in Berlin devoted to solving this very problem. So after seeing many other, others fail, Planck, who was in Berlin at the time, decided to take this up and succeeded in working out an equation that seemed to account for the exact distribution of energy. However, and this is the crucial feature of his integrity and the point that I'm making here, Planck remained dissatisfied with his own equation, and he even refused to pre present it to his colleagues because he had not yet discovered its physical significance. What caused it to work that way? and no other way, he asked. Thus, Planck was confronted with the, exactly the same challenge confronting Johannes Kepler, who, who studied Ptolemy's planetary, uh, planetary epicycles and circular or, the circular orbits of Copernicus and of Tycho Brahe, his collaborator, and concluded that 
however accurate their models might seem to be, they could not possibly be valid because they merely described a natural phenomenon without any concern about discovering its physical cause. So Planck embar embarked on a difficult voyage, which ended up challenging his own gripping axiomatic belief in the existence of perfect continuity in nature. For how could light, for example, be anything but a continuous wave? How could God's creation be merely a, the sum of a myriad of little parts? In this, Planck was constantly at odds with the morally compromised reductionists, such as Lud Ludwig Boltzmann and Ernst Mach, who argued that scientists should abandon all effort to actually understand the causality of complex phenomena, such as the behavior of gases, and should be satisfied with a mere statistical likelihood that a given phenomenon be this way and not another way. But after trying all sorts of black body thought experiments and failing to find a cause, Planck, in what he, he himself described as an act of desperation, reached into Boltzmann's work and hypothesized a model which involved a myriad of little bouncing springs from within the black body emitting light at frequencies, all of which were whole number increments of an extremely tiny constant value, what only later became known as the Planck quantum of action. Planck had discovered a true physical cause, even though he was squarely, it was this, this, this cause seemed to be squarely at odds with his own most cherished axiom of continuity. But, the story does not end there. Planck had grasped a new principle, but only incompletely, clinging to his conviction that light itself was continuous. He thought that it was only light's interaction with the tiny discrete receptors in the black body, which was causing his quantized effect. His paper announcing his discovery then fell into the hands though, of a younger third class patent official in Switzerland named Albert Einstein, who said in effect, well, wait a minute, what if light itself is quantized? And what if the wave nature of light can in fact be ultimately reconciled with its quantized nature according to a higher principle? Well, as they say, the rest is history. You can look it up yourself. But since then, to the day he died, Einstein never abandoned his quest for, what, for that higher principle, resisting all efforts of the Machians, such as Werner Heisenberg, to reduce quantum physics to a statistical game, which only seems to work, but which does not choose to investigate causes. As Einstein famously retorted to these demented fellows, God doesn't play dice. But now, back to music and poetry. I'd like to quote from another fine musician, namely Lyndon LaRouche. In January 1993, I and my wife Renee and Mindy Pechenik visited Lyndon in prison in Rochester, Minnesota for a number of hours where we discussed all matters musical against the sometimes raucous background of the prison waiting room, visiting room. From the transcribed recording, which we plan to publish someday, by the way, uh, let me read you the following to give you a glimpse of LaRouche's thinking at that time. He said, The equivalences of music are not ordinal. They are not quantitative. They're not qualitative, for example. They are in an analysis situs form. That's a term used by Leibniz. And the key to this is two things, LaRouche said. First of all, the musical domain is a quantized field. Notes exist and space is Keplerian. Because you have the notes, they exist in certain locations. There are certain harmonies that exist. They're ordered. And no matter what notes you're playing, the next one is always going to be there. You can change your sequence as much as you please, but the next one is always going to be there. It's all predetermined for you. And this is not alterable. 
and an approximation of the note, only to the extent that you're not cheating, is the note. The note that is sung is, is, uh, or performed is not the note. It's the best approximation of the note. The tone is absolute, and the performer merely approximates that. And if they don't approximate that rather well, we get very unhappy. We get disturbed. But it's analysis situs. The key thing is note, number one. Registration, second. And we've written, just as an aside, we've, we've published a whole uh, book, Manual on Tuning and Registration, which is dedicated to that very question. Continue. And registration comes in many different varieties. It comes in aspects of instrumental colors of all kinds. Or the generic term color is sometimes used. But you have many kinds of colors. You can create instruments. They have colors which are not human voice colors but they become a dimensionality of color. And it's precise, it's determined. You make a string of such and such a type, and such and such a type, and it's stuck. You've got a color. You can modify it, but it's there. It's gonna haunt you, and you won't get away from it. You have to jump to another string in order to get to a different part of your color. And now, I hope you'll bear with me when I cite this passage from Einstein's introduction to Planck's 1932 book, Where is Science Going? And I hope you musicians will get, and, in, and poets will get the point as we move along. Einstein said, the supreme task of the physicist is the discovery of the most general elementary laws from which the world picture, picture can be deduced logically, but, there is no logical way to the discovery of these elemental laws. There is only the way of intuition, which is helped by a feeling for the order lying behind the appearance. And this Einfühlung is developed through experience. And I'll just add that this term Einfühlung, roughly in English, means empathy, which also happens to be Helga Zeppler-Russ's a best English approximation of Schiller's term, Empfindung. Einstein continues, In every important advance, the physicist finds that the fundamental laws are simplified more and more as experimental research advances. He is astonished to notice how sublime order emerges from what appeared to be chaos. And this cannot be traced back to the workings of his own mind, but due to a quality that is inherent in the world of perception. Leibniz well expressed this quality by calling it a pre-established harmony. Physicists sometimes reproach the philosophers who busy themselves with theories of knowledge, claiming that the latter do not appreciate this fact fully. And I think this was the basis of the controversy waged between, a few years ago between Ernst Mach and Max Planck. Planck probably felt that Mach did not fully appreciate the physicist's longing for perception of this pre-established harmony. This longing has been the inexhaustible source of that patience and persistence with which we have seen Planck devoting himself to the most ordinary questions arising in connection with physical science, when he might have been tempted into other ways which led to more attractive results. I have often heard, Einstein continues, that his colleagues are in the habit of tracing this attitude to his extraordinary personal gifts of energy and discipline. I believe they are wrong. The state of mind which furnishes the driving power here resembles that of the devotee or lover. The long sustained effort is not inspired by any set plan or purpose. Its inspiration arises from a hunger of the soul. I'm sure Max, Max Planck would laugh at my childish way of poking around with the lantern of Diogenes. Well, why should I tell of his greatness? It needs no paltry confirmation of mine. His work has given one of the most powerful of all impulses to the progress of science. His ideas will be effective as long as physical science lasts.
So, what's the lesson to be learned here? By way of this, I'm going to throw out the following challenge to poets and composers today, especially young poets and young composers who may also be working in a scientific field. You poets and composers, you know who you are. Because if you have to ask, you probably aren't one, or at least not yet. Take up the challenge set forth before you, not just by Planck and Einstein, but by Lyndon LaRouche and by the speakers at this conference to dedicate your life to changing your own axioms if need be, even your most cherished ones, if you find that those axioms are preventing you from discovering a means of crafting your compositions to become a physical cause in the universe. Are you, for example, certain that what you have created will, in fact, inspire action resulting in increases in the rate of growth of humanity's relative potential population density? Or put more simply, along with Friedrich Schiller, will your audience become better people as a result of experiencing your work? That is the true con content of that hunger of the soul, in Einstein's wor words, or in the words of St. Paul to the Corinthians, love, agape. Be not satisfied with merely pretty, pleasant, childish things. Put yourself through this necessary struggle, and all mankind will be forever thankful. Or as Percy Bysshe Shelley sang to his own Skylark, we look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Yet, if we could scorn hate and pride and fear, if we were things born not to shed a tear, I know not how thy joy we ever should come near. Better than all measures of delightful sound, better than all treasures that in books are found, thy skill to poet were, thou scorner of the ground. Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know. Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow. The world should listen then, as I am listening now. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. Uh, we now are going to go to Dr. Willis Patterson bass baritone, professor emeritus and associate dean of the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance. Before I introduce the, pre the title of this presentation, just want to point out that we do have the Think Like Beethoven book, which is available on Amazon, which is a collection of the writings on music of Lennon LaRouche. And if you have questions, uh, you can uh, submit those questions to questions at schillerinstitute.org for this panel. The presentation being given by Mr. Patterson, uh, which is uh, called The Pre Presence of the Classical Principle in Folk Music. It's On the Universality of Folk Song. My name is Willis Patterson, and I want to briefly discuss with you the value of the folk song as a vehicle for providing some clarity and much needed relief for the perilous days that we human beings find ourselves currently living. I refer not only to the COVID-19 virus that threatens our very lives and the planet on which we live, but I also refer to the societal need for improvement in comfort and understanding of and with each other. This is an issue which, with which we have human beings have struggled for ages to make urgent and meaningful improvement and to use as a more productive option to our many wars. Far brighter and more capable efforts at successfully addressing this vexing issue than my simple words and sincere intentions can offer have been offered by philosophers and 
thinkers throughout the ages. But as I consider my own personal life's journey, I'm caused to reflect on the role that songs in general and folk songs in specific have played and offered to my comprehension and need to understanding and to adjust first to my, to my understanding and comfort of myself and then of my need to better understand those about me, my parents, siblings, friends, acquaintances, and with those whom I come in daily or only occasional contact. Being a slow, notoriously slow learner, I've only partially completed this process of learning, but the effort has been made much more comfortable and complete as a result of my long, lifelong fascination of loving and living the folk songs. Just for an understanding of what I mean, when I use the words folk music, I offer here a definition. I'm referring to the music that originates in and from traditional popular culture and is or is is written or performed in folk song style. This music is usually written to be performed by vocal soloist groups, choirs or small ensembles, or both, but often appears in instrumental form as well. This is music this music is to be compared to classical music much of it raised, based, and founded on long established folk music themes and motifs, but intently, intentionally composed by, by many composers in all cultures. Improvisation is the same spontaneous creative impulse that was responsible for much of the growth of creativity in the repeat sections of 16th and 17th century operas and much of the music of the Baroque era. It is that same tradition of creativity that is one of the essential features of Negro spiritual inspired motivation or improvisation that has enabled folk music to be of such endearment and attraction to the folk from the music from whom it sprang. But the main ingredient leading to this folk involvement is the presence of a text, which puts forth in its clear, non-complex meaning and an inspiration, uh, an inspiration. The absence of prescribed, a, a prescribed set of melody, rhythm, rhythm, and overall form has enabled a universal folk involvement in the making of the musical expression of their woes, joys, loves, and fears, and other profound feelings. Cultural and regional differences, geographical distances, nor climactic impact have not prevented this natural impulse to give clear musical expression to these deeply felt emotions and meanings, and often to enable historical recording of important events and times in their music and the important events of their times in clear, unambiguous language. Being an African-American male, I struggled to better understand the historical plight and puzzle of my people and how that impacted my personal growth and development. That puzzle became a bit more clarified by my relating to the story of the young African slave who questioned his God in the text of this song, Lord, how come me here? On the heels of such work, songs, and spirituals, I was motivated to gradually become more familiar and knowledgeable about the history of slavery, discrimination, and segregation in this and across most of the so-called developed countries of the world. This led me to a vocal an artistic facility with other Negro spirituals that spoke to the 
inner suffering and separations of families that impacted me and many of my contemporaries in how we adjusted to our times and to the circumstances of our lives. And I have used my personal and life experiences and adventures in developing a sense of confidence, personality, and a sense of self-awareness as a means of transformation from extreme insecurity and an awkward, unsure sense of self into a relatively healthier and more competent sense of self. I have not reached perfection, but I may have come closer to a better state of being because of my engagement with the art and the help of music and folk songs working to relieve my tentative and insecure beginnings. I owe much of my sense of transformation to the fortunate introduction of the art of music to my insecure and inf iffy beginnings because of my being so blessed, I cannot help but be supremely confident in the assurance of similar results if a greater immersion into the art of folk songs were undertaken universally. On the heels of such work songs and spirituals, I was motivated to gradually become more familiar with the art of music and other arts that were undertaken and applied to the problems of cultural divisions and racial conflict in this country and on an international basis. My early engagement with the blessings of folk music combined with the gift of a voice, which was and still is pleasant for me and to at least a few remaining others who despite my advanced age say they want to hear me is my constant affirmation of the powers of the art of healing and to do a better job of solving world problems than our wars. 
I know that the gift of folk music exists in nearly all, if not indeed all, cultures and societies of the globe. Its blessings and potential for the needed advancement of personal growth and interpersonal and international appreciation of each human being is what the Ode to Joy by Schiller is really all about. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. Our next speaker is Professor Tung Jimong. He is a noted national cultural critic and professor of American studies at Beijing Foreign Studies University. Uh, Mr. Tung discusses some of the central concepts of Chinese aesthetical education rooted in the Confucian tradition, which are a core part of education in China today. First of all, Thank you very much for the Schiller Institute to invite me to speak at this very conference and to join the distinguished panel of this very great conference. I think this is a very, very timely conference, uh, especially uh, under the general in, uh, background of the coronavirus, which is now running rampant worldwide. Uh, and so, um, I would begin, for example, um, with a presentation given by President Xi back in 2008 when he was visiting, he was responding to a letter uh, to eight professors teaching traditional Chinese aesthetics uh, at this very university called the, the Central, uh, the Fine Arts, Central Academy of Fine Arts. Uh, in that very letter, President Xi mentioned uh, several notions, and two of the notions I'd like to quote here. Uh, the first one being um, de and yi. De in Chinese means virtue, and yi meaning art. Uh, and so both de and yi are supposed to be an integral part of the Chinese um, uh, traditional aesthetic education. And the second notion I'd like to quote here is patriotism and also altruism. Both uh, altruism and patriotism are supposed to be uh, the central tenet of Confucius, uh, 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 Confucius teaching or Confucius learning. Uh, in China, this 
aesthetic education has been so very deeply rooted in the curriculum in high schools, in primary schools, and also in universities. Virtue has always been part of official training, uh, official training here in China. I mean, training officials and training officials with this virtue. And once again, virtue means the skill set, the ability to communicate, uh, pay, uh, compassion, and also the love of one's people, public spirit mostly, and e meaning art, the art, for example, to communicate, the art to convey the message, the message of the regime, the message of the ruler. In this sense, e has played a very large uh, role in uh, communicating and connecting the people in the, the family, the community, and even people beyond the border. The second notion, as I always cited in my teaching, uh, which is altruism. China has been very strongly committed to this very notion of altruism. Back in the 1960s, for example, uh, China has been uh, even exporting food uh, to the outside world, for example, to Africa, and committing medical team to Africa, helping with the malaria and building railway state, uh, railroads in Africa. And in fact, the first railroads were, uh, uh, in a sense, were built by China in the 1970s and the late 1960s. And China actually, at the time, was, was suffering this greatest famine, uh, the, the worst famine, actually, in its own, uh, in its own history. And so um, uh, Chinese government has always been, in a sense, um, committed to this very principle, this Confucian principle of saving lives saving children and saving these critically ill uh, elderly patient in ICUs. Look at all these um, uh, elderly patients being saved and walk home, uh, uh, back home healthily out of this very, uh, their critical conditions previously. And so um, uh, these two great notions has been deeply rooted in the psyche of the Chinese people. And like uh, a famous scholar I admire, by the name of Tu Wei Ming, who has been teaching Confucianism worldwide. And he actually quoted a lot of Confucianism, this very central value in Confucianism, the public spirit, the work for the devotion to work for the public community, and also the border, the people beyond the borders and out there in the cosmic community. And to, exist, to this very extent, I think that uh, China shall be continued uh, uh, to be committed to helping the world and helping the people around the world on this planet now suffering this very pandemic. And lastly, let me just quote uh, uh, the great philosopher uh, Confucius that all roads uh, that leads to prosperity is the road that we must follow. The, the road leads to all under heaven. And so all under heaven, in a sense, is the philosophy of Confucianism now translated into the contemporary Chinese politics. Like President Xi has also, uh, in a sense, said that um, uh, we need to work together for the community of shared future for all mankind. And thank you very much. Thank you. Our final Concluding speaker for today is Diane Sayer, the founder and co-director of the Schiller Institute New York City Chorus, and she's speaking on the employment of the principle of chorus in politics. Diane? Yes. Thank you. I think the intent of this conference is that we should never find ourselves in this situation again. That is, the world has been gripped by disease and death in a way which never should have happened. As has been said many times already, Lyndon LaRouche warned about this in the 1970s and 1980s. It was knowable. It was therefore preventable. But we did not prevent it. In the great, powerful nation, the United States, 
we have now had about 55,000 deaths. And globally, we are over 204,000 dead of the coronavirus. If you know that something is about to happen, which will kill that many people, don't you think it would be worth acting to prevent it? The question of culture is the question of why we fail to act and how we are going to ensure that we don't fail in this way again. Let me ask you a few unpleasant questions. And I'm glad uh, we're joined by the professor uh, who may have some answers to these questions uh, or can help us answer them that we're going to have to ponder if we would like the world that comes after this disease to be better than the world going into it. Why did China have so few deaths per capita relative to the United States, France, Italy, and most other nations? When people speak of just letting the elderly and weaker people die, people have heard about herd immunity and so on, uh, in order to keep the economy open, why are those people not hauled off to hospitals for the criminally insane? Why is there no mobilization to do something about the situation in the prisons and the homeless shelters with the COVID infection? Why have we not heard of a major mobilization to do something about the situation of the 4.2 billion people on the planet who do not have indoor plumbing, including 2 million Americans who don't? Even after we saw the lockdown in Wuhan, which began on January 23rd, how many of us imagined that we'd all be sheltering at home by the time of this conference? We could have and should have known better. Many of us gathered here for this conference are members of the International Caucus of Labor Committees and were members at the time that Lyndon LaRouche warned about global pandemics. And yet we are surprised. Everyone is quick to blame someone for this crisis, but looking for a scapegoat will only serve to prevent us from solving it. We would do well to remember Christ's Sermon on the Mount as reported in the book of Matthew for many reasons, but today this one in particular stands out, Matthew 7, 3. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. It is worth remembering that Christ also tells us that God's standard is perfection. From Matthew 5, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This is a high standard, which very few people take personally except in applying it to others. We're now going to hear from Shakespeare about a related question, and I'm going to introduce my partner in this presentation, Leah de Grucci, who is one of the activists of the growing worldwide youth movement. She's from New Jersey. Leah. Thank you, Diane. Hello, everyone. My name is Leah, and I want to thank you for joining us today. So keeping all of those questions and in mind and the idea of perfection, which Diane brought up, I would like to now turn your attention to the question Shakespeare poses about mercy. In Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, a Christian merchant by the name of Antonio finds himself in a seemingly impossible situation. In an effort to help his friend Bassanio, get a loan that he might use to win the hand of his beloved Portia, Antonio promises to forfeit a pound of flesh, literally cut out from his very own body, as collateral in the event he cannot repay the large loan which he borrows from the Jewish moneylender Shylock. And I point out there during religions because it serves as a major point of tension in the play. 
their respective single issue that makes them feel justified in their hatred toward one another, so to speak. One might liken it to the same tension we have today between democracy and communism, or between Judeo-Christians and Muslims. So, Antonio agrees to such a deal in the confidence that his own merchant ships return having made a profit, therefore leaving the prospect of the collection of this dear payment a real but unlikely occasion. However, having just learned that he lost all of his ships at sea, and along with them any hope of repayment, Antonio is brought to the court of Venice, where Shylock eagerly waits to collect his bond. It is at this moment that Portia arrives, disguised as a man and a doctor of the law, to deliver a message that we might imagine coming from Shakespeare himself. In this instance, Portia takes on the role of an ancient Greek chorus to speak universally to all of us, not just about this case, but about all such instances in which someone has done wrong and the other person has the opportunity to show mercy. Therefore, upon being told that he must be merciful, Shylock asks Portia, on what compulsion must I? Tell me that. This next speech is Portia's response. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. <laughs> Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. The scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself, and earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoke thus much to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which if thou follow, this strict court of Venice needs must give sentence gainst the merchant there. Without undergoing a thorough literary analysis of the speech, what can we take away from this? Firstly, the quality of mercy is not strained. No one can force you to be merciful. No law on earth can force you to love. It must be your choice. Secondly, that we become most like our creator when we are merciful, blessing both ourselves and our debtors. And thirdly, that there isn't a single one of us who is not in need of mercy, because without mercy, none of us could possibly see salvation. I think it's also worth noting that throughout this scene, Portia acknowledges that the barbaric case in which a man could demand the forfeiture of a pound of human flesh for the repayment of a loan was legal in this court of Venice. The bond was legitimate. There was no human law preventing it, but by being barbaric in nature, it violated natural law. Thus, Shakespeare, like Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from a Birmingham jail, seems to be pointing out the way horrific things, barbaric things, can be done completely 
within the auspices of a man-made judicial system, such as dismantling a public health care system, such as triaging those people who are the most vulnerable, such as refusing to help develop the infrastructure of those countries in the developing sector and our own infrastructure for that matter, and instead bailing out Wall Street. Or, God forbid, such as thermonuclear war with China, all of which are legal, but morally repugnant. Now, did she have reason to be upset? Absolutely. The so-called Christians spat on Shylock, abused him, slandered him, made him their enemy. In the famous speech from Act 3, Scene 1, Shylock asks, If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And we get but a glimpse of his suffering. But what does Shylock conclude from this treatment? His speech continues. And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why, revenge. The villainy you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. In contrast, what does God command of us? That we be perfect. That we love our enemies serve despite mistreatment, and obey even unto death, and forgive so that we might be forgiven. But Shylock, in the moment his humanity is most called for, is so blinded by hatred and a sense of revenge that he becomes no better than the Christians he despises. And having refused to show mercy, he is shown no mercy himself and winds up losing far more than he bargained for. <clears throat> I suppose you could say, oh, but that mercy stuff is only for Christians. Or, oh, but that only works for individuals, not for foreign and domestic policy. Is that true? What do we believe government is? Do we just accept that government will always be a necessary evil that we will live with, but that we assume will undermine us at every step. If we have a constitutional republic that is of the people, by the people, and for the people, does it not necessitate that we, though without an official office, are a part of that government? And thus, if the government is not functioning properly, then we are not functioning properly, and vice versa. If we are not functioning properly, the government most certainly is not functioning properly. What is the standard, then, which determines proper functioning? What is the mission or intention that moves us toward proper, proper functioning? It's not just a constitution. We have the Constitution on paper. It's been with us here, in name at least, while our, our country has totally degenerated. The point being that if we hope to restore the country, then we individually must on the responsibility of restoring ourselves. And this is precisely the place where classical culture comes in not enforcing you to love, which would be impossible at any rate, but by inducing and encouraging you to pursue the path of agape. And I turn it back over to you, Diane. Thank you. So let's go back to those earlier questions. 
what prevented us from acting to avert this tragedy, which has already taken so many lives and is taking many more as we speak? What seems to me to be missing is not simply an inability to act on behalf of the future, but a misidentity about the relationship between the individual and mankind and the relationship between mankind and the universe. An irony occurred to me as I was thinking about this because even someone with a monstrously huge ego has to think about other people actually needs other people because of course the ego can only be fed by worrying about what the other people think of one. <laughs> That's not the kind of relationship I think we should each aspire to cultivate with our fellow human beings. Actually, the relationship, whoops, excuse me. Actually, the relationship we have to mankind is healthiest if it is a relationship to those people who are no longer and not yet alive. That way we can avoid the seduction of the popular opinion of our time. Lyndon LaRouche used to mock people for thinking that history began the day they were born and ended the day they died. He himself would tell us that he was over 2000 years old and by his sense of immortality, I should probably be speaking of him in the present tense. Lynn lived in both the past and future simultaneously, which is why he spoke with such passion. We all remember the July 25th, 2007 webcast and his tone of voice saying, there is no possibility of a non-collapse, none. He could see the collapse in his mind's eye more clearly than he saw the people seated in front of him. He is not surprised to see us all speaking to each other from our remote, socially distanced locations. He told us that this would happen. How can we develop that informed quality of passion, the insight to remove the beam, beam from our own vision which prevents us from seeing what we need to see in order to act. Thankfully, Beethoven is here to help us. His intent is clearly spoken through his music, but just to set aside vicious rumors that genius is bounded by insanity or is random and not a product of intent, I'd like to share with you some words from Beethoven himself. He writes in a letter to Czech composer Johann Nepomuk Kanka, quote, you yourself know that a man's spirit, the active creative spirit, must not be tied down to the wretched necessities of life. And this business robs me of many other things conducive to a happy existence. I have been compelled and still am compelled to set bounds to my inclination, nay more to the duty which I had imposed on myself, i.e. to work by means of my art for human beings in distress." Unquote. And in a letter to Countess Marie Erdodi, quote, I gather from your last few lines to me that you, my dear friend, are still suffering a great deal. Man cannot avoid suffering, and in this respect, his strength must stand the test. That is to say, he must endure without complaining and feel his worthlessness. And then again, achieve his perfection, that perfection which the Almighty will then bestow upon him. Does that not express exactly the quality of self-transformation which is required of us now? Lynn once told us that before entering a battle, one must first do battle with oneself, because after all, Unless we're physically bound, and Lynn didn't even let that stop him, what 
prevents us from acting according to truth? Well, first of all, there is a commitment to know the truth, which requires a certain humility. And then, having had the courage to examine our own faults, we can find the courage to stand against the faults committed by others. We are our own biggest obstacle. The strength to examine our failings does not come to us out of ego or in isolation, but comes because of a love of mankind, future and past, which compels us to endure the discomfort of admitting our imperfections. This requires strength. And while rage and harshness appear strong because they are intimidating and they seek to intimidate or they seek to intimidate because they are weak and driven by fear. Humility is perceived as weakness and misread by evil people who often destroy themselves through their own arrogance in the face of such humility. So in this period, all of us have been forced into relative isolation, but we must not isolate ourselves from the future of mankind. And the near future is precarious. The near future will determine the trajectory of our action as this pandemic leaves us, which will determine the future for centuries to come. Since it is the year of Beethoven, the Schiller Institute NYC Chorus took as its Apollo project Beethoven's remarkable late work, the Missa Solemnis. This is one of the most challenging vocal choral works ever composed, <laughs> but we are finding it well worth the effort, even though in our virtual rehearsals, we can never actually hear what we sound like. Causes me to think of Keats, the unheard sounds are sweeter. As Schiller wrote about chorus in dramatic tragedy, quote, to do justice to the chorus, therefore, one must transpose oneself from the actual to a possible actual state to a possible one. But one must do that everywhere where one intends to achieve something higher, unquote. In the midst of the known horror of corpses being temporarily buried in mass graves in parks around New York City, and nursing homes converting garden sheds into morgues, and the terror and suffering of nurses and doctors who are working long shifts without sleep and personal protective equipment. The chorus in our daily life serves exactly the purpose to which Schiller ascribes it in the drama. This is Schiller, quote, while the chorus brings life to the speech, it brings calm to the action, but the beautiful and high calm, which must be the character of a noble work of art. The mind of the audience must maintain its freedom, even amidst the fiercest passion. It should not fall prey to impressions, rather take its leave of the emotion which it suffers always clear and bright. What the usual judgment tends to fault about the chorus, that it dissolves the illusion, that it breaks the force of the effects, is actually its highest recommendation. For it is this very blind force of effects which the true artist avoids. It is this illusion which he disdains to excite. If the blows with which tragedy strikes our heart were to follow one another without interruption, suffering would vanquish activity. 
we would be immersed in the material and no longer hover over it. By holding the parts apart and stepping between the passions with its calming reflection, it restores our freedom to us, which would be lost in the storm of effects." Unquote. Beethoven's masses, both the mass in C and the Missa Solemnis to an even greater degree, employ the principle of chorus in an amazing way. Unlike earlier oratorios, where the soloists are entirely alone in many sections and the chorus is alone in other sections, the soloists and the chorus are completely intertwined in their parts. You can clearly recognize the distinction between them, but the relationship between soloist and chorus allows the chorus to respond to the soloist in a continuous development of complexity and beauty. Beethoven's intent in his masses, as Bach's intent through the use of chorus in the form of chorales in his settings of the passions of St. Matthew and John, is to elevate the identity of the congregation to participation in God. Beethoven spent four years composing the Missa Solemnis because he agonized over how to best reflect the intent of the meaning of the mass in his music. The text of the so-called Latin mass begins with the words, Kyrie eleison, which is Greek, <laughs> Lord have mercy, because in these words, we are removing the beam from our eye which prevents us from seeing the truth. Beethoven's setting of these words in both his masses, especially, of course, in the Missus Solemnis, informs us of the quality of emotion which we must bring, like warrior angels, into the sacred mission for the immortality of mankind. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. We are now going to go into our question and answer section, and we're going to begin it first with a greetings to our conference from Gregory Hopkins, the founder and artistic director of the Harlem Opera Theater. But he's more than that. Uh, it's a recorded, pre-recorded pre statement, but I want to say something about Gregory. He was one of the pioneers that back in the 1994-1995 period traveled with members of the Schiller Institute in Germany, France, other nations. Uh, to pursue something that had happened back in the 19th century where African-American artists had traveled there and very deeply affected uh, various people, including Brahms and Dvorak. And it was at a time that we were talking about trying to reform what was called the National Conservatory of Music as a movement uh, in the 1990s. And that's when Mr. LaRouche, Helga, and others met many of these extraordinary persons and we began to make this point about the identity of uh, the actual content of the African-American spiritual, Negro spiritual, uh, and classical music. Uh, it's going to be interesting when we get to the question and answer period because there are a few questions that have asked about that, and I'm very glad about that. Uh, and what we're going to do is show first the greetings and then come back to the entire panel uh, for a discussion. Greetings. My name is Gregory Hopkins. First, allow me to acknowledge my colleague and friend, Elvira Green. She was originally to do this slot, but circumstances did not allow it. Elvira is more educated, eloquent, and better prepared than I am for this spot. And she's prettier than I am. But alas, I am your bird in the hand. The trouble with a bird in the hand is that there's always the possibility that things can get messy. Well, it was the 1980s, nearly 40 years ago. I was introduced to the Schiller Institute by my friend and mentor, 
Sylvia Olden Lee. As a result of that meeting, this then young singer, through Schiller, had the great privilege of performances and seminars with countless storied persons like William Warfield, who along with Sylvia served on the board of Schiller, Raymond Jackson, and George Shirley. Along with a cadre of other musicians, Schiller gave us the opportunity to share high culture through music all over the country and abroad. Whenever I enter my office at the church, I'm reminded of the life-changing tour that we did in France with Schiller. The poster adorns my studio wall. Fast forward to a few years ago, Schiller and Harlem Opera Theater, the organization of which I am the artistic director, collaborated to commemorate Sylvia Lee's 100th birthday with two different programs, one at the Schomburg Center for African American Culture and the other at Carnegie Hall. Great music in great spaces. And Schiller has always promoted high culture through the presentation of great music, particularly classical music and Negro spirituals, the root of all American music, making our cultural heritage accessible, especially to the young and underserved. This is inherent in the Schiller legacy, who himself, even as a young student, was interested in the discussion and development of classical ideals. He not only reviewed these cultural platforms with his friend and mentor, Goethe, but many others, including his student contemporaries. Schiller learned at a very early age that it was the, of the utmost importance to expose people to things of beauty and value while they're young. Now is a time of great crisis, as gyrating and cursing and disrespect seem to define our musical landscape, not to mention the obvious presence and effect of this plague that we call COVID-19. Were Schiller alive, he would rail against the social and political corruption spewing as tales of testing, ventilators, and financial stimulus regale our spirits. Our society has de degenerated physically, economically, morally, spiritually, and culturally. This is an especially difficult period for musicians, particularly African-American artists, who have seen their entire contracted annual salary disappear in a puff. Even in my church, I was forced to furlough my entire music staff. Many musicians survive with no hope of salvaging their season. Additionally, many less fortunate live in less than ideal circumstances, making isolation difficult, if not impossible. And some have no health insurance. I am told that the Chinese symbol for crisis is reversed to become the symbol for opportunity. That gives us the sanction to seize this as a time of opportunity, a time for change in the artistic community, a time for creating a new paradigm of harmony and cooperation. 
an opportunity for presenters to look at presenting in a new and different way. A time for finding ingenious ways to entice audiences. A time to find new ways to raise money. More than ever, now is the time when great art is indispensable to aid and inspire us to triumph through adversity with beauty. In the words of the old spiritual, I'm so glad trouble don't last always. We've got their attention. We've got a captive audience. What will we do for them? Thank you. So now we're into our question and answer period, and we have a problem because we have a limited amount of time, but there are a few things I want to state. First, send questions to questions at schillerinstitute.org. We are going to answer all the questions. We won't be able to answer them live now, but we have a, uh, a kind of a combination of one question and a sentiment, which I'll indicate, and you'll see why. It said, Thank you all for this most beautiful and inspiring panel. There has been so much wonderful material presented that this could clearly continue for hours, if not for several days. My question for Helga and the other panelists is, can we do more seminars like this over the coming shut-in weeks and beyond to allow for all of this material to be developed, digested, and discussed? So I think that's just sort of a, an obvious sentiment that I think a lot of people would have who has seen this, have seen this so far. So what I'd like to do is sort of bring the entire panel in, uh, and that will be Helga and John, Diane, <clears throat> Dr. Patterson, and Professor Simpson. And I'd like to first uh, hear uh, any responses that any of you have to what you've heard so far, and then we'll go into questions. <clears throat> this is funny that this would come up because you know, in reflecting uh, this morning about the uh, discussion yesterday, I said, oh, this is really great because, you know, we can turn this calamity of not having a physical con conference into the opportunity to have many such Schiller conferences. And uh, why not have another one next week? And then I thought about the reaction of our <clears throat> members who would probably faint at that point because of the effort uh, which went into this uh, conference. But I think um, it, this is actually a, a very obvious idea <clears throat> that you know we should use this medium uh, of international communication. And while we may not have such a broad ranging conference uh, you know, in a short uh, distance, but I think you know, the commitment that we can really start this international dialogue. And, you know, we want to have a renaissance movement. I mean, this is not a finished matter. Uh, you know, I mean, the coronavirus has changed our life. It will get worse. Uh, the leading vi virologist of Germany, uh, Professor Trosten, or one of them, just warned that the incredible hedonism which is expressed now by the population going to you know wanting to go out to restaurants and you know just pick up life that he warns that we will have a, a terrible second wave uh, and he's extremely concerned about how this will affect the you know present uh, <clears throat> present uh, development of this global pandemic so I think that we have to think about this conference not as a one-time event, but you know there are also very clearly signs, you know, that people are thinking how to restore the old uh, monetary system, you know, as quickly as possible. Maybe some reforms, a little bit more cosmetic uh, justice for the third world, so-called. I mean, there are all kinds of people now. Uh, you know, planning what should be the post-pandemic uh, uh, world, and that, there is no end in sight. So I would suggest that we find a way, and we don't have to decide on the modality uh, exactly now, but that we do keep in such a dialogue and that we, you know, include more people uh, to expand it. You know, I think that we have to have a worldwide renaissance movement. And actually, I wanted to not forget 
that I really would like all of the people who like this approach, the aesthetic education, overcoming geopolitics, to get a better understanding of the physical universe, the scientific uh, groundings of why we are here, what is life, and not last not least, what are the principles of physical economy, which we will hear in the next panel, uh, <clears throat> that we basically uh, ask, I'm asking all of you who agree with this perspective to become an active member of the Schiller Institute, because we have to absolutely fulfill this idea to make a completely different, more human world after this uh, crisis is over. So I would like to ask you, join the Schiller Institute. Let's have more such seminars. And especially, I just want to say that, you know, the uh, Apollo program for a world health system is something which will only happen if we get an army of people who are fighting for that young people, old people, you know, we have to use the need for a world health system as a vehicle to get a just new world economic order. So I'm sorry that I'm going a little bit, little bit haywire, but, you know, I, I really agree this, with this idea. Let's make a movement which stays in touch and grows. Okay. Uh, let me just ask person by person. Diane, you have anything to add? Um. Well, I agree with Helga. I think that's wonderful. And there are many things we can do as international conferences and also uh, regionally one place at a time, uh, et cetera, or one topic at a time where we could do something every week. I just uh, was very struck in this discussion. You think about music, both um, Gregory Hopkins and Willis Patterson in their presentations had words from the spirituals. And I think what you find is when you're immersed in music or drama, if you're studying Shakespeare, you come into a difficult moment and the words of the song or the words of the poem come into your mind. And, and that also, I think, underscores something that um, preceded this panel, which was a discussion that we had, uh, Dr. Simpson, Patterson, Dennis Bede, myself, Elvira Green and Helga about the relationship between folk music or the development of folk music to culture. So I think this is really important. And uh, I would also like to encourage everybody to join the chorus since our rehearsals are now remote. You don't have to be anywhere near New York City to be part of our chorus. And if you wish to do that, you can get in touch with us through the Schiller Institute. Uh, since you men mentioned him, I see Dr. Patterson sitting there. Dr. Patterson, your thoughts? His microphone muted. Um, yes, he's not able to hear. Oh, now we got him. Go ahead. Uh, that that uh, uh, in, in included uh, the uh, Shakespearean uh, expressions, um, and and then Diane came back and talked about the impression, the Im presence, and importance of the texts of spirituals and of art songs. So that's that's a, a, a very potent for me, uh, outcome of this, of this panel. And, uh, and I'd, I'd certainly like to be uh, uh, a participant in a future discussion of those topics. Okay, well, thank you. Dr. Simpson, can you hear us? I'm trying to bring up his audio. Hello? Yeah, now we have you. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, I thought it was a marvelous uh, session. Uh, I was quite surprised at how well it went because my own problem is it's reading my own computer's writing. But uh, it's a it was a wonderful session, and the, the words of, uh, uh, were so inspiring. And Diane, uh, your words were marvelous at this time of crisis, as were Helga's. And uh, 
the way it all fits into creativity and uh, the great works of, of Beethoven, uh, of Hall Johnson, of, of Schubert. Uh, it's important that everyone see how all of those works connect with each other. And uh, I just want to thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you very much for participating. John? Yes. I would just like to underline one aspect of this for all people who are practicing artists. Um, I've had many discussions and conflicts with, with, with a number of them. Uh, the, and, and I think that the, what Gregory brought up in terms of the, the difficulties that artists are having today is, is, is very relevant to that. The only way that an artist today is going to be able to overcome these kinds of difficulties, including terrible personal financial difficulties, is if they start really acting and thinking as if they are exactly what Shelley uh, described as the unacknowledged legislatures, legislators of the world, that, that in a sense, more than ever, artists today are part of a government. It's not a world government, it's a government of nations, but it is definitely a government which, which and, and the, the artists are the leaders of that in terms of the ideas which will uh, help us not just out of this crisis, but help us, as I said in my speech, to make not just people happy, but to make the universe happy because and this is something that Lyndon LaRouche was extremely concerned about, that the universe itself is a self-developing entity. It's, 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 it is self-developing. And by us doing what the universe wants us to do, we are making the universe happy. We're making the universe sing even more beautifully than it is today. And that means that, that the artist has to get rid of all smallness of their hearts. Um, some artists that I've talked to have actually, you know, bought into some of this anti-China stuff. I don't like China. You know, the, the Chinese that I meet are, are bad people or something like that. This has to all go. And um, I just appeal to everyone who is an artist in any form and also a scientist too. This is the time to really open your heart and, and to, to feel like you're a part of the government. You're not alone. And I think these, these forums that we're having will be a very important way of making that clear to everyone that you're not alone. Um, we are all in this together and we have to fight it through. That's what I have to say. Thank you, John. So what I'm gonna do, given the limitations of time, is I'm going to read a set of questions and we are going to let the panel discuss these questions and you'll see that some of them are rather interesting and you're going to have things to say about them. Okay, so let me get first of all. There's a question from Germany. What do spirituals have to do with classical music? I have to say before I go on, this is my favorite question. What do spirituals have to do with classical music? In their simplicity, spirituals are comparable to European folk songs, which are also beautiful. But isn't it too profane to talk about spirituals directly after Beethoven's Opus 98? For me, that's like comparing a picture by Botticelli with something of Andy Warhol. Well, I think it's an interesting question as to whether you want to compare pictures by Botticelli to those of Leonardo, but that's a, maybe another matter. That's a little editorialization. So that's one question. Then there's another question from Guy Albergini. He asked the question, think like Beethoven. Where do I start to be able to do that? That's his question. Also from Germany, uh, what does current world politics have to do with classical art? This is a question directly for John Segerson about his com comparison of Planck's quantum and music. 
He said, could you go over the discussion of the note and the quantum? I've heard it said that notes don't exist independently, but only in the context of intervals. Then, and that's from art, actually. Uh, Evelyn Lance asked the question, this started out as the year of Beethoven, but quickly became the year of the coronavirus. What can we do in addition to this conference to bring back the year of Beethoven for the population? Uh, last uh, set from here is uh, from Antonio Hernandez. This is from Venezuela. I congratulate you for the wise topics for debate and discussion about our existence on this earth. We have not been very creative when it comes to religious matters. We still maintain the same models imposed by the different religions of the world, but we continue to see the same actions by humanity. War, death, envy, greed. So what should be the role of religions in the world? The question I constantly ask myself is should they even continue to exist? What are the religions good for in this so troubled world? I would appreciate it if you could help me clear up this doubt. So that's the set of questions you've now heard. You can do many things with this, uh, but you're going to have to answer something. So why don't I, just for purposes of mixing it up here, I'm going to start with, um, let's take Eugene Simpson. Let's see what he picks. <laughs> I wonder if the questioner being German has ever seen the big collection of Brahms songs based on folk songs, you know, not to speak of, uh, of that, but uh, we also saw, saw what Dvorak had done. I pointed that out. Uh, we have Bartok doing the same thing. Uh, we have uh, Beethoven using Razumovsky and his Razumovsky quartets, folk songs. I don't know where the questioner comes from. Uh, classical music has been dramatically influenced by folk songs. Okay, very good. Uh, Diane, how about you? <laughs> well, on that question, again, I also wonder what the definition of classical is because if you take the question of art from the way that Schiller looks at it, which is that one should be ennobled by one's participation in the music, whether as audience or as performer, then it's very obvious that the quality of emotional education, which comes through the spirituals, uh, is meets the standard of Schiller's definition of, of art, whereas a great deal of what we call so-called classical music does not meet that standard. I'm not referring to Brahms or Beethoven, but you take something like um, Ravel, uh, Mussorgsky, Berlioz, my favorite, um, French composers, Debussy, uh, there's a certain quality of arrogance and uh, emotion which is devoid of a profound sense of what it means to actually be human. And that is what makes something classical art, according to Schiller, which is the standard which is upheld in the spirituals because they are a, an affirmation of the dignity of man. Uh, and that's what you hear in a composition by Beethoven. So in that sense, and Diana, I see if them. I might interrupt, of what we yeah. see here is that the uh, spirituals of Hall Johnson took from the classical songwriters, but then uh, Dvorja took from the spirituals. So the mm -hmm. classical yeah. forms actually draw from the spirituals and the spirit the classical arrangements of spirituals draw from the art songs 
know that probably everybody yeah. has something to say about that. Let me ask Dr. Patterson, because I don't want him to. Yes. Um, it, it occurs to me uh, from my sort of slanted point of view that classical music really owes its being in large part to the in the, the innovation and creativity of folk songs and of folk music. Um, so much of the reputation, very well deserved reputation of classical composers is because they went to the fountain of folk music to begin and expand their artistry. And um, I, I think there's almost, it's almost impossible to separate uh, the two uh, and, and call one a genre in and of itself without including the other. Okay, Helga? I would like to uh, uh, answer the uh, person from Venezuela on the usefulness of religions. Um, well, first of all, I think, you know, there are two traditions in many religions, if not all. And one is, you know, the just taking the scriptures uh, and, you know, being contemplative. And I don't think that that particular form of religion is very uh, useful because it tends to, uh, you know, it tends to be very self-centered many times. And I, I much more like the, the other tradition, which says that it's good works uh, and that there is no contradiction between um, faith and science. Um, and that is the tradition of Augustinus, of Cusanus, of Leibniz. So I think that, that first of all, there are differences. Then uh, I think also there is not necessarily a contradiction between the great religious feeling that there is a higher purpose, that there are laws of the universe, that there is a plan in the universe. Um, and my late husband, Lyndon LaRouche, has written an incredible important paper, which is called, What is the God who's, who, where we are in the image of? And I would suggest that you read that paper because it answers the question on the highest possible level. Now, if you think about the passions of Bach, the oratoriums, uh, or the great masses of uh, Mozart and Beethoven, you, you get a, a, an absolute idea that religion in its best tradition is exactly celebrating the role of the individual in the universe and our ability as a creative species. Now, if you want to express this in religious terms, you know, we are the image of God, and as Cusano says, we are in the living image of God, imago viva Dei, exactly because we, in, we, <clears throat> we are the image of the most noble aspect of the creator, the, the creativity. And I think that the, uh, as long as religions are furthering that um, identity of human beings, there's no problem with it. It's, it's very good because you have two essential ways of the moral improvement of people. One is religion, which demands that people should be good. This is the you know, common denominator of all great religions. But there is also, unfortunately, uh, and, and secondly, aesthetic education, which has the same demand without you know, necessarily having a religious component to it. But there is also you know, the takeover of religions by the ecology movement, uh, that they are more green uh, than the greens themselves. In that case, it's you know becoming the opposite of what the purpose is because the universe, the creation is, as John was saying just a second ago, it's a self-expanding, developing universe which expresses exactly you know that <clears throat> that idea of a of a limitless creator. And, you know, Schiller, for example, has in the philosophical letters this beautiful conception that the universe is a sort of God. And Kepler, if you think, you know, he said 
that the more you study the physical universe and the the way the stars and the heavenly bodies move, the more you realize that there must be a fantastic plan behind this universe. And that he, he turns that into a prayer. So I think that these are very profound questions and you don't have to, you don't have to take any one religion because you know what we are trying to do with the Schiller Institute, you know, we try to get a dialogue of all great cultures and all great religions. But you know, this is an ecumenical idea because you know it has to be all inclusive of the one humanity. So that is what I think. Okay, John. Yes, I'd like to take up the two uh, two of these questions. The one about <laughs> what's this? Uh, what relevance does Beethoven have, or thinking like Beethoven have? Um, the you have to realize, if you haven't already, that everything that you do has a consequence for everything. Leibniz. If you, uh, I, I would encourage you to read the monadology of Leibniz, a wonderful, wonderful work and not too long, but extremely rich. And uh, the, the quotes that I had from Einstein uh, were directly as a result from the fact that, that when Einstein was growing up, he, he, uh, he studied Leibniz and, of course, Schiller as well, because he used the term the monad being that the, the, there's an individual entity which you can call the human soul, uh, which has absolutely no weight and no size. And you cannot weigh a soul. Um, you can't uh, any any soul, and but nonetheless, it has the greatest force in the universe because it can it it actually has an effect on all of the other, and it's a reflection of everything that's going on in the universe. It's a beautiful idea, and. When you're, whenever you're doing anything in this world, it has a consequence. Or if you do, don't do it, it has a consequence. What, we're, what, what the works of Beethoven do and what the works of great art does is that it organizes, it creates a harmonic kind of resonance in all of human civilization implicitly in such a way that the practice of human civilization with the universe is rendered more efficient and more beautiful and more harmonically organized according to the laws of the universe itself. So therefore, that's why I, in my talk, I wanted to emphasize this question of, of art as a physical force in the universe. It's, it, it, uh, there, there's, there's no, and to the extent to which you ignore that or you choose not to acknowledge that in your own work, whatever it may be, um, those are things that will not help the universe along, not help humanity along. Now, just one other thing on this, this question of the uh, quant, uh, uh, Planck and the quantum field. I threw these, these things out, not to give you specific answers, but to pique your curiosity, especially of those who have not, never, not looked into this. But I'll just point out that, that, that in the 1980s, when Lyndon LaRouche was working uh, very closely with musicians, but also with uh, the, a foundation, uh, the Fusion Energy Foundation, which had, ended up being uh, shut down, uh, by George Bush, uh, the first George Bush, and uh, by LaRouche's enemies um, as part of the witch hunt against him. Uh, we were, he was developing on not only a discussion of Kepler, but a discussion of the way that the musical system functions in the actual domain as opposed to a linear domain, in what you might call the complex domain. Uh, he developed, and this is laid out in a, a manual on registration and tuning, which is available. It's on sale. Um, you can you can read it yourself. Uh, but it's the idea that 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 first of all, notes are not things; they're the result of action in the universe. Specifically, Larouche pointed to what's called triply connected 
conical spiral action. And what you find is that this is an organized action in which all of the notes, so-called notes, are along that spiral are singularities, but in such a way that each of the, the values of those notes are not just frequencies. There's no such thing as an exact frequency that you can get to these things. That every, every note in the, in the musical domain is a complex entity that also, you might say, yes, it has a value, but it also has an intention. And this is what he's getting at with the question of the quantum field. Uh, so you can look a lot into that. I, I think we should, that would be something that we could discuss a lot more at, at a later point. But that's, it, it's, and that's, that's where it gets the, the going back and forth between such really fundamental ideas about, about the nature of our physical world and the quantum, this quantum question, which is still a big, big question, which has still not been, been really worked out completely. Uh, there's huge amounts of debates even today. Um, but to look yeah, John, at that if, and then go I back could. and forth. Okay. Right, right. Because, because I just noticed on our screen that we have Professor Tong Ji Meng. Uh, I don't ah. know if people realize, but it's uh, 2 a.m. in the morning over there. Yes. Uh, yes. So yes. I, def I, I want to make sure you have a chance to say whatever you would like to say to us. Well, good. Thank you very much for giving this very opportunity, and um, I'm very glad to take uh, to uh, uh, take part in this very great occasion, this conference. And I think that I benefit so much from all your great uh, presentations and insights. I think yes. I mean, it's high time for us. I mean, Chinese people in and outside China to do some kind of uh, rethinking and so searching. And especially in terms of revitalizing the so-called uh, the classicism or the classical Chinese philosophy, as I mentioned in my presentation, I think uh, Confucianism is um, uh, can be seen as a uh, kind of a recipe for the current disaster. I think to answer that very question um, from Germany, perhaps that what does classicism have to do with the current crisis? I think the, the relevance is that Confucianism uh, continued to be, in a sense, uh, continue to be, in a sense, relevant and resonant towards the problem that we are facing today. I think that uh, one thing in terms of this very disaster causing the loss of life, for example, we think, I think that in China, relatively, we have fewer deaths is because that um, from the very beginning of it, this very Confucianism is at work. And two major principles are at work, including, for example, benevolence, the caring for the subject, caring for the people and saving lives. And one particular principle in Confucianism is that um, you respect the elders. You uh, would uh, single out the elders uh, as the target of your respect and perhaps in under su such a circumstances you are supposed to save first thing first your elders your elderly in the family and elderly in the community and perhaps in elderly in the states outside that very particular city or that very particular province uh, and so once again i think that uh, i agree that the artists are supposed to be um governors, legitimators, and uh, Confucius would also respond to this as that um, um, learning, for example, learning the Confucian way is not, uh, in a sense, it is all for this very uh, virtue, for self-cultivation, for public good, for the public spirit. And in this particular context, I would, um, in fact, uh, re-invoke this very notion of benevolence, and working for the public good, uh, put people's interest um, as a priority before you're above your own personal interest. Confucius also, Confucius also emphasized the great importance of music. Music actually reflects uh, whether this country is governed well or not. A very, in a, according to a very famous statement made by Confucius, if you desire to know whether the country is well governed or not, you should go and listen to their music. And in this sense, 
I think that Beethoven, Schiller, uh, Bach, all these great Western European, Western European, uh, European traditions proved to be a huge source of inspiration to people here. When we listen to these great music, we examine ourselves, we are self-critical ourselves, and we need to learn from the people uh, and artists uh, in the other parts, of the, the rest parts of the world. So thank you very much. Yeah, well, Professor, sure. <clears throat> I want to really thank you for being on. We, we had a pr technical problem, apparently, having you on from the beginning of this. But, Helga, I want to ask if you have anything that you have to say in response to him at this point. Uh, I, 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 I would like uh, uh, maybe you know, some of the uh, Mr. Patterson and, and uh, Simpson to communicate with uh, Professor Tang, because I think this idea of Confucius that you can tell by the music if a state is governed well. I think this is a, a very obvious question. And, you know, I, I think, you know, I personally think that the, if you look at the uh, much of the popular music of the Western countries, which unfortunately has penetrated China also, you know, I mean, when I visited China in the 90s, I always thought when you open the TV, comes out a Chinese Britney Spears. And uh, I think that, you know, it, I think it would be good to have among uh, a comment from the musicians on this Confucian idea that the music tells you about the condition of the state. I wanted to, I wanted to uh, comment on uh, the gentleman from Beijing and his statement, which I think is a, a very sort of universal encapsulation of most of the topics <clears throat> that the panel has dealt with today. And that is the concept, as he verbalized it, of altruism. Doing the highest good for the most persons. This is to me a, a personification of, of, of the best definition of religion, the best definition of love and of quality in art, altruism, and I thank you for it. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Simpson? I would only say that uh, in America today, uh, rap music and hip hop are known for telling it like it is. I think that's the phrase. And um, unfortunately, when you look at what's happening in America, that's really the way it is. Who is dying in this pandemic? Uh, the greatest number of people who are dying uh, are the minorities. Blacks lead the list. Uh, then browns are next. Uh, so when our president says, oh, well, uh, maybe we'll lose 50,000 people, I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, he looks at it in a political sense. Well, we're losing Democratic voters. And if we go back to the Powell memo of about 1975, uh, Powell said the only way Republicans could win uh, is by reducing the number of Democratic voters. What better way to reduce it than with a pandemic, where if we kill 50,000 people, uh, 30,000 of them will be black uh, Democratic voters. It's sad that that influences that political thing influences the humanity of America. We always hear that America is the greatest. Well, we have a higher incidence of infant mortality. We have less effective education in many schools. Uh, don't get me started, uh, but how can music improve this? When I taught in New York, it was during the age of a higher horizon. And believe it or not, those same schools that were supposed to be problematic schools or schools that I was able to send kids in my voice class straight to Juilliard, uh, you know, because uh, all they wanted to know was what could a better vision be and how can music help me get there? Unfortunately, 
many of the schools didn't want you to teach. Oh, you're doing Mozart. Uh, I want show tunes. No, the great music uh, creates the great people and vice versa. And I, I think I've said enough. <laughs> well, you said what you thought. And that's useful. Uh, I would just like to say, uh, Professor Tong, that we are, because of time reasons, we can't continue. Uh, But I would think that, as was said earlier, we'll be able to meet again in this way and have further discussion. Uh, At this point, uh, I want to try to wrap up. It's going to be difficult, but I see that Leah's on. And I want to let her say something. And then, Helga, we're going to go to you for a kind of a close. So, Leah. All right. Thank you. So I guess in thinking about what the relevance of classical culture is today is just, I mean, classical culture really isn't a part of the culture we have right now. So if you like the way that things are, then I guess, yeah, forget about classical culture. If you're okay with, you know, your the way young people are educated, how children are educated, the kind of culture that they get right now, if you think that's good, if you think that's helping them, don't bother with classical culture. For me, the aspect of classical culture is what drew me to this organization because I I did study acting in high school and college, and I love acting, but more and more I just grew disheartened because of the ugliness of the art. It was very, it was very arrogant, self-centered, and there was no purpose. And so more and more I felt like, you know what? Maybe, maybe art isn't for me, because so far this, I don't see art as being beautiful. It was ugly. It was, it was, it was death engendering to the soul. So uh, coming upon the LaRouche movement and the Schiller Institute and was, has been deeply impactful for me to know that art is about beauty and art is about love. And I was like, Oh my God. So my, my internal feelings, were correct and the world has been lying to me. And I would, if people are interested in learning more about drama, I would highly, highly encourage you to read uh, Schiller's uh, speech or essay called Theater Considered as a Moral Institution. I cannot get through that paper without just crying my eyes out because like that is what I was searching for. And I would really encourage young people, especially, to seriously take a look into classical culture. Come join us for these conversations because you will change. And that's all I have. (laughs) Okay. Helga? Well, I just would like to make two points. Uh, I said earlier that, you know, Lynn Lynn LaRouche, uh, absolutely had also the idea that you know you need to have a classical educated population to have long-term survival of civilization and when Leah just said you know that this classical culture is not part of the present uh, society then what does that say about our ability to survive uh, now let me just very briefly uh, specify what is it this classical thinking uh, there was many, many beautiful discussions between the first <clears throat> violinist of the Amadeus Quartet, Norbert Breinin, uh, with, with Lynn. And they had, you know, hour-long discussions about the importance of thorough composition, of motif führung, and, you know, that is actually <clears throat> the essence of, or it leads to the essence of classical uh, music and classical composition in poetry, because it means you have a a poetical or a musical idea, and then you exhaust the idea according to a certain form. And then when you have exhausted it, it it is complete. And that way, 
it's a completely different way of thinking than if you look at, for example, at the dialogues of talk shows where everybody picks up some predicate the other one just said and it goes on and on. It has no structure and it has no truth seeking. Real classical thinking is truth seeking. And, you know, that was one of the absolute common agreements between Lynn and, and Norbert Prinin that what makes great art is that you are trying to be as truthful to the intention of the composer or the, uh, the poet as you possibly can, can be. And the Amadeus Quartet, for example, you know, they would rehearse uh, <clears throat> for months and months to get to the absolute intention of Beethoven in the late string quartets. And you know, I mean, this, this is really a method of trying to not be guided by opinion but be guided by true principles. So that I think is a very important thing which needs obviously more discussion. The other thing I wanted to say is picking up on what you, Leah, uh, said earlier in your discussion about Portia, you said one cannot force somebody to be merciful. And I would challenge that statement by uh, saying that both uh, Confucius and also Lessing uh, said, and I tend to agree with it, that you can switch on love if you decide to do so. And I think this is really important because, you know, I mean, it's all about education of emotions, the, you know, education of the, what John mentioned earlier, the Empfindungsvermögen, the ability to, emp to have empathy with the world, with the common good, with you know the humanity as a whole, that requires that you educate your emotions. And I am absolutely certain that one can do that, and you can test it. You can you know it's a it's a something you can absolutely prove. Take your most important enemy in your personal environment, your aunt or your colleague or your girl, your schoolmate, the one you really can stand. And then do something good for that person. You know, it can be a little thing like giving flowers. It can be more important like developing something which addresses the creative mentality of that person you can't stand. And you will see that that person being addressed to the most profound aspect of his or her personality will immediately change because people respond to when you address the best in them and they turn out something better than before. And when you do that, you realize your own emotions change also because all of a sudden you have acted an act of love and you, 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 you just don't stay on the level anymore, oh, I can stand that person, but you have transformed your emotions towards a higher degree in, the respect, in respect to agape. And therefore, I think the question of agape and mercy is a derivative of agape. It is something one can decide. And, you know, I just would like to, you know, leave it at that. We can debate it some other time. But I'm absolutely certain that if we want to make a cultural renaissance, we have to turn on our agape. Hmm. <laughs> All right. So that is the conclusion of our panel today. So we want to thank Diane Sayer, Dr. Willis Patterson, Dr. Eugene Simpson, Professor Tung Jing Meng, John Siegerson, Leah Deguchi, and Helga Zeblerouche. So our next panel, which is called The Science of Physical Economy, is apparently beginning in 30 minutes, which I have to convince the technical crew is actually possible. So we'll be starting then. We certainly invite everybody to attend that panel, and we'll be attempting to start in 30 minutes. <laughs>